Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is um, the 23rd of April, 2014, and Matt Williams agreed to come on, and we got a few teachers who are using uh, Do Now and uh, KQED's education program that you'll find out more about on this show. And, um, and you know, you may know about already and aren't using or are using, and we hope to get some great ideas and, and, and talk together about Do Now. Um, which we will very quickly, after introductions, turn over to you, Matt, uh, Matthew, to to describe to us. Um, Chris, do you want to start us off there a little bit? Um, introduce yourself and just briefly say your how you've been using Duna. Sure. Just start. Um, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school um, English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, I use Do Now, KQED's Do Now program um, with my media students. So every Monday there's usually some question around um, a current event or some, um, you know, topical issue. And um, students from around the country, um, a lot of them from classrooms of National Writing Project teachers, those students um, discuss current events through that um, portal. So it's good stuff. So by the way, we should mention that we are we are all uh, part of the education, um, National Writing Project's Educator Innovator Group um, as well. So um, that's good to know. Um, Danae, this is your first time on TTT. Welcome. Um, Hi. Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Danae Boyd, and um, I teach, I co-teach with Janelle Bentz, and we're at New Tech High at Capel, and we have a global issues course, and I'm the world geography facilitator with Janelle, who's the English one facilitator, and uh, yeah, so um, we're using so, Janelle's as current events as well. Say a little more about that course. It meets every day. How long? It's a 80-minute block course, meets every day. Um, we're a PBL school, one-to-one uh, -one, uh, Mac laptop school as well. Um, and we blend world geography and English one in our course, which is called Global Issues. Cool. And the name of your school? Is... New Tech High at Coppell. Cool. So welcome. Thank you. Janelle, you've been on, but... Very, a very long time ago. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's been a while ago. Thank you, Paul, for having me back. Um, yeah, so we basically use it, um, like she said, um, as current events, but I've noticed that it really helps to strengthen their writing, as, and we can get more into that um, depth in that later. But um, it really helps our learners to um, state an opinion and back it up with evidence. So it's been a really good opportunity for our kids. Cool. And Chris and Janelle, and along with um, Minu Rami, right, who was on mm -hmm. just last week, um, presented at the spring meeting. Is that? Do I have that correct? Yeah. With okay. Matt. Along with Matt, right? Mm -hmm. So, so this is uh, recapping some of those some of those things you already said, but uh, in a more conversational way. And by the way, I, I see people putting the mute on. If there is sound in the background, feel free to mute. But I love to interrupt. Um, so I, I like when you talk over each other. So you can leave the mute off if you can. It's, I, that's how I like to roll here. Matt, introduce yourself if you might, if you will, and um, tell us how you got that Emmy. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm Matt Williams, and I'm the educational technologist at KQED Public Media in the Bay Area. Um, we're the local PBS NPR station here. And um, I have an education background and a media production background. I used to be a classroom teacher for five years and a higher ed teacher for uh, four years. Um, and along, along the lines of, of making films and doing uh, a lot of video journalism. Um, and, uh, and you taught in the Bronx, the did show. you not? Sorry? You taught in the Bronx, did you? I taught in the Bronx. I taught at IS-22, uh, which just down the street from where Jordan I Elmott. Junior High School um, on 167th and Morris Avenue. Um, and I started a, a video production uh, elective there, which got the ball rolling in this whole direction that I've gone in. 
So since I brought it up, you do have to say about say something about the Emmy, but because it, it it shows a little, another side of you a little bit too. So. Yeah, give me a little street cred. <laughs> yeah. uh, I uh, so I produce uh, along along with being um, the sort of the lead on Do Now here. I produce a, a series called Art School, which is a uh, a video series that looks at artists and their um, their work, their craft, their inspiration. Um, and also it accompanies often a, um, a how-to video on how to make art. Um, and so mm -hmm. last year we uh, received uh, an Emmy for one of the episodes that we produced on uh, an artist named Mike Shine who does this really great graffiti stencil work um, in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and it was super exciting. Totally uh, did not expect that in, in, when coming to KQED that that was something that I would even qualify for. So. It's in, my, it's in my house. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. The um if, and and that's all under KQED's education or not? Yes, it's all under it's, KQED education. So could you break that out a little bit? Like, what is KQED education, and then where's do now within that? KQED yeah. education. Uh, basically, we are we're part of we're sort of a division of KQED where we focus on on producing. Uh, training and distributing to educators and learners um, in the areas of science, arts, and news slash civics. Mm -hmm. And um, we produce a lot of great free media resources like Art School um, or Do Now. Uh, we have a, a news uh, blog called The Lowdown, which is a great sort of uh, entry point for learning about the news and um, looking at the context of where news sort of uh, the stories of how news kind of get to where they are, how we get, how we got to where we are. Um, we also have a lot of uh, great science ebooks that we produce for um, iPads for students to look at um, really interesting science topics through real interactive, immersive media that we produce. Um, and uh, and do now is basically uh, we have a whole sort of look at you know media literacy through the lens of these different content areas, and media literacy has shifted a lot recently to sort of integrate these new media literacy tools and um, making and produce, like, you know, there's now so much of a need for students to, to produce their own media, to write with media. So Do Now kind of looks at all three of our content areas and provides a platform for students to really engage in some, some really relevant topics um, using some of these new tools and, and providing an open space for them to to share those ideas and those arguments and, and to comment on each other ideas and to really develop this nice rich uh, platform of, of an authentic audience using Twitter to, uh, to be main, the main uh, sort of uh, platform for that discussion, but it's not only Twitter and it's, and it's not going to only be Twitter. Mm -hmm. Dana, could I invite you to say, say out loud what you said there in the chat? That you said something about uh, the lowdown. Lowdown being a great resource. Nice. How do you, yeah. So I love the lowdown because each <laughs> weekend when I'm developing the next week's lesson, um, and I just go there and I find exactly what I need to construct the um, direct instruction, what the learners need to go and research further, because they have to cite evidence when they post and. Um, they have to go and actually do research and have an informed opinion um, to go along with what they're saying. Um, so that text evidence is really important. So we always guide them within the assignment to those lowdown resources. And we specifically say, you need to use these two or these three, and this is what we expect to see. So love it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so Do Now always gives a, a sort of a a basic overview of certain topics. It does not by any means really go deep into the issue and the lowdown often serves as this great opportunity for students to dig deeper into these issues and right. it's, it's written for high school students essentially um, and so and I think news oftentimes is written for a high school uh, reader but they don't give the context which is always what's missing I think with with what's going on in the news. So the lowdown does a great job. Matthew Green who's the editor of the Lowdown does a great job of, of synthesizing these complex issues and provides that context. So who does all this work? Sounds like a lot, man. And to yeah, keep we, up with we it. have a whole yeah. education team. We have uh, three education uh, 
sort of content managers. Like we have a science education manager and an arts education manager and a news education manager. And we have uh, we just hired two new uh, producers who produce for arts and science. And we have me as the educational technologist, sort of taking more of a of a lead in just all of our production. Um, and we have a we just hired a new lead instructional designer uh, to sort of look at how we're looking at this content and how we're developing a roadmap to for for educators and students to learn the tools to to participate in uh, and engage in our content. And then we have our director, who sort of is our steward. And I would add too that you know sometimes the teachers are also part of that mix there too. So like um, <clears throat> you know for instance this year Janelle and I and Danae I'm sure uh, have created some resources too so um, that yeah. helps too that synergy I think. Yes, definitely. I mean we couldn't do it without the, the collaboration um, and, and working with teachers to who really put it put our content to, to use and, and do it in amazing ways and really just fuel the fire of of, of, of sort of reinforcing what we're doing as, as being um, authentic learning experiences and valuable learning experiences. But I think Chris is referring to actually creating resources too, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, they, they, yeah they've, they've definitely been developing um, educator guides and um, we're going to be, you know, this semester we're working on developing these media uh, activity um, prompts sort of based on some of the work that we've done this semester with Duno and, and, and Chris and Janelle have really sort of led that that work with a, a, a group of other uh, uh, National Writing Project teachers. Um, I have to say, um, sorry, I'm jumping in because... Yeah, um, <laughs> no, you're supposed anyway, to, Janelle, but just I say your to, name. Uh, Janelle, yeah, this is yeah. Janelle. I have to mm -hmm. applaud um, KQED and Matt because to be able to reach out to the teachers who are actually in the trenches and say, you know, hey, I know that all this stuff is going on and I know you guys have topics, but really this is also what our kids are interested in and giving them that authentic platform to discuss it and that outlet where they know their work is going to be um, even pub like just made more transparent and made more public, it really excites them and when they see that their suggestions have been taken into account, I mean it just brings their work to another level. So it's been really exciting for us. Can you give an example of that? Um, I think, okay, so um, when we were doing the Do Not Egypt, um, we did a whole big project on that, and it ended up, um, we ended up talking about Siri and things like that. And um, Danae actually um, posted a topic about Malala. And so they did some extra work on the I Am Malala um, mm -hmm. campaign. And so they had that, but then we suggested, hey, is there any way that we should discuss Malala? I mean, you know, it's their, their, she's their age, and, you know, it's really someone they look up to, and they had no idea. And so Matt responded probably, like, the next week. And for them to be able to put the media, because a lot of them made really nice um, movies, videos, um, for them to be able to put that, push that media out through KQED was really, really exciting for them. And still to this day, it's some of their favorite products that they've created. And, and, and definitely the uh, the to go along with that what Janelle said is is every, once a month the do now prompt is is directed by uh, teachers from the National Writing Project and our and our working group and and figuring out what topics will really resonate uh, so that they can their students can make some really awesome media arguments to be part of that conversation for that week. So there's a little so one do now topic is sort of pre-planned in advanced. So that media production can happen in the time frame that it needs to happen to then post. So can you break that down a little more? How how yeah. do you like how do you work with those teachers? Um, well, we, some people here, right? But yeah. others, Chris and, and, and Janelle and Minu, um, and there's there's a few other other teachers. There's about eight teachers who we've worked with. Uh, for now, mm -hmm. this is the third semester, and um, you know we have we produce to do now prompts every week, um, you know, where civics is always once a week, every Friday we post that, and then every other, every Tuesday we, we rotate between an arts and pop culture do now, and then a science do now, so those are, those uh, rotate every Tuesday. Um, and so one of the civics posts, the one at the end of the month, is 
is sort of is decided through uh, Google Hangouts and in, in meetings with uh, the teachers from the National Writing Project Working Group to uh, to come up with some engaging topics that 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 really invite uh, interesting use of media production with that that contribute to the conversation and the topic, and also work with what you know learning goals teachers have uh, with their students. Um, of course, Janelle, Chris, and, and Danae can talk better about those needs. But, but from the KQED sort of publishing standpoint of, of what we pick, we, we try to we, we understand that there's only so much time in, 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 in the week to make media. So uh, we can't expect uh, students every week to make a piece of media as part of their argument for their contribution or uh, to, the, to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Danae, I'm going to call on you again. <laughs> yeah, hi. So, the vines, what's that about? And how does, well, does that work with this? Yeah. We had um, seen in the correspondence that Matt had sent out that they were going to do a um, video roundup soon, and um, the vine is a right. seven second video. Did you want to jump in, Matt? Okay. No, 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 sorry. Okay. And um, so. For the Earth Day Do Now this week, the Do Now Green, one of the things we've asked them to do for, they get weekly bonus points for creating digital media every single week. They get bonus points, and a lot of learners take advantage of that, um, is to create a seven-second vine of a green space in an urban place or somewhere that um, they're finding um, nature in an unexpected place. So, and they're posting that with their tweet. So, so what we're Along, doing? Sorry, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I was just gonna say this. Um, alongside with this, it doesn't go with the do now because we had um, some other content that we needed to cover, but um, we're also covering Romeo and Juliet. Um, and so, as a character analysis piece, we used the um, KQED um, tech, tor tech tor tutorial about making gifts or gifs, however you want to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, and so they actually create gifs. Um, to present the essence of the main characters in Romeo and Juliet. So you can use them with you now or also separately, but they're really valuable pieces to integrate into the classroom and kind of hit home. Like I said, I think that when they use um, media and make products that they consume, um, they're allowed to, di allowed to digest and encouraged to take that content to a, a deeper level. So it's been really exciting to have those resources. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I think what's also interesting, what could, which I try to sort of push, is is even taking something like you know if students are reading Romeo and Juliet and looking at characters and doing character analysis, is even taking a topic that comes up in you now and make have them make a gif about you know what would what would uh, um, you know Romeo or uh, Mar Mercutio think about you know sweatshops and then maybe they could talk about how clothing was manufactured back in you know Elizabethan England or when the, whatever the time of the, of, the, of the book was. I don't know. I just think it's really interesting to take mashups of what you're doing uh, in the classroom and just applying it directly to uh, a social issue or, or some sort of civics issue, even if it seems absurd. I think it's a really interesting activity. So you're answering the question that a teacher out there might be wondering, like, this all sounds great, but how do I have time to do this with everything else I have to do? Is there... Do you... Do you ever deal with that question, or Matt? <laughs> or um, somebody else want to see it? Yeah, I think I think a lot of times teachers, in the, in the sort of the, I'd like to think the infancy of this project, teachers take those prompts um, and the questions and and take them very literally in terms of oh well we're not studying that this week so I don't think we can do that and I and I, mm -hmm. I that's why I beg to sort of see how creative you can get with do now in terms of, of doing that kind of uh, mashup. Um, and I think you know, do now is such a, it's just it's just a real simple, elegant kind of uh, activity that it can be taken in so many directions and encouraged to to take in in those different directions. That you know, it it only adds value to the conversation if a bunch of students are kind of bringing in this whole different angle to it, and just like wow, that's really interesting, um, and and adding adding that flavor to. Uh, a conversation that a lot of times in the beginning of the semester when there's new students uh, participating, 
it's very much students just sort of all, it's like a choir of students talking about their opinions about these issues. And the engagement or, or the level of critical discourse is, is not as strong as what happens later in the semester. And you see that kind of growth. I, absolutely, I think that's one of the, that's one of the things that we presented on um, at the spring meeting is how at the beginning of the year, um, definitely also the educators who had used Do Now previously in the previous year, they knew like what expectations to set up and kind of said, okay, well, you know, yes, answer the prompt, but don't forget to also provide the text evidence. And so at the beginning of the year, you know, there was a lot of this is my opinion on that, which is you know, okay, that's good. I'm glad that you can vocalize your opinion on important topics. But the fact that you can support your opinion with evidence, so then it becomes this informed opinion, and then you have this discussion and this possibility for discussion on multiple informed opinions, um, the discussion becomes really rich, and it's not just a he said, she said. Well, it's like, this is what I feel because of X, Y, Z. And all of a sudden, people are listening more and being able to think more about, oh, that's why people think that. Um, I also think that, yeah, you could say that the do now is just like another thing to do on top of everything else, but mm -hmm. there are certain skills that you just need to practice again and again to get better at. Um, so the whole idea, the whole notion of like, okay, let's have a thesis statement, let's support it with some evidence, you know, and then, and then like hit it home with some reflection, that's something that they can do in, within the context of the do now and still have new and different and varying topics that are relevant, and yet they're going to repeat that skill, but still have this really exciting, <coughs> rich um, understanding of current events that's happening around them. And then, if you couple that with the uh, fact that they're going to be able to make these uh, multimedia products, that even makes it the, the learning richer for them. When Janelle presented in DC, um, I was in the classroom with the learners, and they were so excited to um, tweet um, as they were. They felt like they were true participants, and when they got a response back uh, from Matt, uh, they were they just lit up, and they were really excited about that. So that that brought a real highlight to to the afternoon. And they, they were like, what if I tweet him this topic or this topic? Do you think he'll do it later or whatever? So they were really excited about that, too. Yeah, I think it's exciting that um, Do Now is encouraging them to, yeah, here's your learning, but like, let's make your learning public. Let's make your learning transparent. And you don't have to have one set idea, one set opinion, one right answer. The fact is that a lot of answers can be plausible and correct. But it depends on how we discuss it, and it depends on how you research it, and you know what do your sources look like. I mean, that's another thing that do now, and um, also the lowdown teach um, our learners is, hey, is this a bias source? Is this not? You know, how can I critically assess the sources that I'm using, the media that I'm consuming, and then also produce products, produce responses, and you know, publish my thinking, my learning. So, hey, people can understand why people have the opinions that they do. Can somebody break down for me? Um, I, I'm sorry, that's my favorite word tonight. Uh, sorry. But can somebody describe um, the sources? Like, uh, you're a PBS station, so do you mainly use P PBS material, or, or how uh, do you think about that? Mostly we do. A lot of times we, we take content from uh, PBS NewsHour mm -hmm. um, or NPR radio segments. Um, um, sometimes we use original KQED content, uh, stuff from our, we have a, a radio show called Forum. Um, uh, a lot of our KQED content is, is, is local, like looking at local issues but with, that, with the national sort of relevance kind of spin. So, uh, but we also, we're not, you know, we also take content from other, other sources as well, um, you know, not only public media. We try to find the best piece that, that really um, speaks to how it looks in the news. Um, sometimes we've picked stuff rarely, but sometimes we pick. We actually used like a Daily Show episode or segment, and it was kind of more of a media literacy, like how what's the, how the sort of a look at the way media represents things. We just had something on uh, Flight 370, and it was more about how is what's media's role in representing this issue, um, and sometimes so sometimes we're like taking other we're definitely taking other sources. 
Um, we're also starting to partner more with youth media organizations that have um, students uh, select topics um, and, and go through a process of, of writing prompts for Do Now. So it's becoming much more student driven in terms of what the topics are for, for each week. Can you give an example of that? That's interesting. I can give We're an doing, example uh, of that. Chris, go ahead. Speak up. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, uh, my students were really interested in, uh, they really liked the Radio Rookies episode not too long ago in there with WNYC. NYC. Mm -hmm. And um, they did a thing on um, uh, prescription drugs in Staten Island and, and leading to heroin use and everything. And uh, my kids were really fascinated by that. And then, you know, we were able to connect. Uh, we live in Utah, and so, um, you know, perceptions of Utah might be that there wouldn't be maybe, you know, a big drug problem. But it turns out, you know, we're actually, Utah is a big prescription drug uh, using land here. Um, and so, you know, we were able to then kind of bridge to our own situation and... Um, you know, talk about the issue in our own setting. And then uh, we learned a lot more about, just from the student stories, just all the things that are going on here. And surprisingly, you know, a lot of heroin use in certain pockets of our area, and, and that led to conversations as to why. Um, but I thought that was, you know, it was driven by that youth, um, or Radio Rookies group. Um, and they told just a really compelling story, too. So then we were able to talk about the, you know, the, the elements of storytelling as well. Yeah. So yeah. So Radio Rookies is is a they've contributed a couple times to do now. We've worked with uh, Youth Radio out of the Bay Area, which is sort of like the West Coast of Radio Rookies, mm -hmm. um, where they do a lot of uh, um, radio stories that are then later uh, uh, presented or or um, distributed on NPR. Um, but we also have developed a relationship with uh, California Academy of Sciences. Um, which they have an after-school program where their students, basically the, the program is that they, you know, they brainstorm, uh, pitch, and, and, and write uh, Do Now Science prompts, and they do it once a month. Um, and they pick topics that they seem, that they feel are important um, topical science issues. Um, and then our science team at KQD will, will edit those and then we'll post them. Um, and I think this model is really, it's great, and we're doing more of that. We're, we have another uh, Chabot Space and Science Center. It has an after-school program that we're working with. Uh, the Bay Area Youth uh, Video Coalition is a youth media organization that we're, we're working with and thinking about doing the same for arts and pop culture. Um, and I just think it, it adds much more, I think, value to uh, an engagement when, when youth are picking the topics, um, presenting them to youth to then discuss. Um, I think adds uh, more, um, you know, it's just, it just seems much more um, engaging for, you know, cause sometimes we miss the mark in terms of what we think might be important for young people. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's one thing for us to be able to design meaningful um, learning experiences for our kids, but when you get learners to be thoughtfully designing their own learning experiences, that's, I mean, that's it right there. I mean, so I do see do that. Um, Wait, I'm not gonna let you do that. What do you mean? That's it. <laughs> okay, and I'm done. Fine. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> well, I think unpack, that's something. Unpack that we, it. <laughs> I what do you think mean? That that's, that's it. I think that's something that we strive for because um, more often than not, um, for example, when Danae and I have ideation um, sessions with our learners to help us go through. Okay, well, if this is the text and the content and the standards we want to go through, help us out here in making an authentic, engaging project. Well, you know, Matt's doing the same thing with these kids at the Science Academy by having them come up with these science prompts. They're trying to figure out, um, you know, what is a relevant, meaningful question that's going to hook them. And more often than not, like with our kids, it's really rigorous and um, very meaningful. And a lot of times, they will do something that um, definitely reaches further beyond the four walls, further beyond their closest community, um, and it's really boosted like the global citizenship of our learners. Cool. Is that good enough? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. a good description of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
<laughs> well, I think Matt, um, Matt also mentioned the Common Core standards, but yeah, that's yeah. Uh, uh-huh. But go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it dovetails with that. But you know, I think mm-hmm. in a you know, for me, a larger sense is like, what is school for? And um, a lot of what's getting the short shrift, I would say, these days is what originally I think was intended by people like Washington and Jefferson and Horace Mann. You know, like schools are about citizenship and. Yeah, you know, they're sure we need to be globally competitive and we need to have people able to graduate, you know, job ready and all that stuff. But I think um, more and more it just seems like the importance of an informed citizenry and people who can uh, knowledgeably talk about, discuss controversial issues, you know, that to me is a real strength of what's going on here because. For me, it's hard to gather all the resources that Matt talked about. Um, you know, there's quite a bit that comes out each Monday. There's usually like a video of some kind, and there's some background reading, so links to more articles. So as a teacher, I've got this option of just like, okay, sometimes it's I'll just turn them loose on it and say, okay, <laughs> here's this week's do now. Go check it out and get back to me. Uh, sometimes we'll watch the opening video together and discuss it. Sometimes I'll go to an infographic that they link to and we'll talk about it as a group there. But, um, you know, having the ability to, like this week's do now is about um, should there be limits on campaign donations and Citizen United kind of issues. Those are pretty tricky, sticky issues that really involve a lot of discussion. And um, what I find is that um, a lot of times those topics will kind of loop back. So we may not get it this time, but you know, maybe two months from now or maybe next month, there may be another similar case where that touches on something that we've discussed before. So what I find is the students, as part of the evidence that I think Danae and Janelle were talking about, a lot of times they're going back to arguments that they discussed earlier, for instance, with poverty. You know, that manifests itself many ways in the different do nows, you know, minimum wage or, um, you know, a lot of things like that. So the fact that things recur, I think, has been a really uh, important part of their citizenship forming, you know, their knowledge base. That's interesting to me because as uh, as someone who's sort of looking at the schedule and, and trying to keep it a diverse selection of, of topics, um, I wonder what students think because sometimes we do come back to it within even the same semester and, and I I hear a little voice in my head of my students saying like, again, <laughs> kind of thought. Um, but, but it's not just again, it's, it's re, it's, it, there's a new sort of angle on it and, and it's building upon conversation and, and, and research that they had already done. So it's almost a time where they can shine because they've already done a little bit of pre-thinking weeks before. So I think that's that's really cool. One one of the things Chris just uh, described there, though, and it makes me think, working with sixth graders, some of whom are you know just barely beginning to read, um, dealing with this material, you, even with somebody who is more you know more along the line um, in their reading and writing, like unpacking it and being a critical user of the material feels like something that could take a lot of time at for some things. Do, Janelle or Danae, do you experience that? Or, like, do you wish kids spent more time on understanding the material, or do you, do you, are you able to take the time to do that? Well, we run the weekly do nows um, in the background of whatever project we have going at the time, so it's something that um, we framed in the beginning was, you know, this is your expectation, this is your current event that you'll have every mm-hmm. week. Um, it's going to change. It's going to, you know, be something that you may be really interested in or something that, you know, you've never even heard of before that you're going to learn about. But these are the expectations. And then, you know, from there, they'll just jump into it. And some get it done on Monday or Tuesday. And it's due on Friday. And then we have others that, you know, they'll wait till Friday at 5.50, right before it's time to turn everything in. And then they'll submit. So yeah, you're going to have the gamut from the kids for sure. Um, But 
we see a value in it that they're really taking their learning um, to the next level. They're in charge of their learning. We ask for certain things to be shown, and when we see those, we reward those. Um, and we love the Do Now roundups because when our learners have their work recognized there, then we also recognize them in the classroom amongst their peers, and they see value in that as well. What's a roundup? A roundup is a, is a sort of a recap of the discussion from a do now, uh, and we sort of talk about the spectrum of conversation, and we, Im we embed student tweets uh, that show examples of, of, of the different opinions. Um, and we're going to be actually tinkering with the idea of turning roundups, or adding to the roundups, adding a video to the roundup that would be like a hosted series where ooh, a, a do now anchor person will talk about and share. That them. is cool. Yes. And we're, we're still thinking about the title of that. We're thinking about what's the word on do now. Mm. <laughs> no. um, I think, uh, so the Put, current events... We'll and, and would yeah. you would you use something like, like a, a Hangout or something to do that, or how would you do it? It'd be, it would be, no, it would be like a YouTube video that we would then post um, and on, on the do now roundup that then has all the, the embedded tweets along with that as well. Um, so okay. it would be, it would be a ho ho when I say hosted, I mean like a, like kind of like I understand. So host. Janelle, you were saying something? Yeah, so. I was just going to say, um, we started um, this year with a year-long project. We call it Project Element. So it's based on Sir Ken Robinson's book. We want to kind of get them closer to figuring out, you know, what, what they kind of want to do with their lives. So one of the things that we decided we had to do was, you know, let them explore more current events and figure out, you know, what else is we to get out of this bubble. Um, so, oh, can you hear me? Sorry. So, yeah, we got um, you. okay, we got to get out of this cop hell bubble. So, do now has really helped us to um, get them out of out of that and really look at issues that affect them, even though they're across the world. So, for us, it really fit nicely within the broader picture of our year-long project of um, do now, of our project element. So before we lose it, I, I, I do want to mention, because um, you, you just described how you're making this fit a, another project you're doing, right, Janelle? And can, so let me just hear that again and say it back. So you're saying that, that they're doing this project about what they want to do? And right, what, okay. so it's based on... Some examples, the, what do they come up with? Yeah. yeah, so it's based on the element um, by Sir Ken Robinson, and that idea mm -hmm. of you have to find something, yes, that you're good at, but something that you're passionate about mm -hmm. um, to really make a difference, and then to have a life that's, you know, that you will find value in. And the biggest thing is, especially at this young age, we don't expect them to find the element but we want to get them closer, and one of the ways to do that is by exposing them to different ideas, different cultures, different issues, different social causes, um, while we can. So um, Danae and I, you know, laid out said, well, you know, we are going to study current events because yes, this is a world geography course, but I mean, current events you can teach geography through that, and you know, by using do now in our classroom, we have the current events. We are able to give them that exposure to different ideas and different cultures and, and um, different problems that they might not have ever encountered or even thought that that impacted them. Um, but then you also have all of the rigorous tasks of, you know, looking through texts and listening to um, podcasts um, and figuring out, well, you know, how does this inform my opinion or how does this shape my opinion or where was I before? Where am I now? And so we revisit that idea of project element and have them reflect on the work that they've been doing for the six weeks and say, hey, well, how does this shape what you're thinking your element might be? Because they all read the element over summer. <clears throat> and so they have that moment to reflect on how all the activities, including their do now activities, have impact them, not only like within school, but maybe on something that they might be interested in a wider scale. Mm -hmm. Danae, do you have anything to add to that? Or some examples of, of what elements kids come up with? I'm just curious about the background a little bit. Well, they're still definitely in the process of discovering. Um, and as we 
dig deeper into them, they'll mm -hmm. comment to us and show in their work how they thought that they were really interested in this, but now that they explored this new avenue, they're finding that they really have an interest in that. We just um, heard from a learner earlier today how she had talked about um, at the beginning of the school year, she really thought that she just wanted to be a lawyer and um, you know how important that was to her and lawyers make lots of money and things like that and now she's starting to look at in different directions and I think because she was having that conversation with us and you know it's it can be attributed to us asking her to explore all these different avenues and different topics and things like that and it's just every week it's just something new something new every week that she can explore and she can comment on and and she loves to do it so does that answer your question I guess yeah <laughs> sure I think it pushes us along. I, so, so one of the things that Chris and I, um, I think, have found, and, and Chris, you'll help me with this question maybe, but um, is, that, is that when we have kids on Youth Voices um, find topics and issues that they want to explore themselves, I'm always surprised at what they come up with, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so using something like Do Now, um, how do you use it without it? And so let me just boldly say this and maybe it's good in without it becoming a prescribed curriculum right so that so that how do you keep room for kids own individual explorations and it sounds like um, Danae and Janelle you're doing that in some way but it sounds like a tricky thing to do a little bit mm -hmm. is that a fair question <laughs> yeah I could um, speak from my perspective because um, kids are s still taking on a lot of projects on their own and so there is kind of some like like I said sometimes I'll throw I'll throw it out there and say you know just just do it now and get it done uh, and you know look at the you know the, the sources and and they're pretty good at kind of gleaning things and um, sometimes you know maybe that doesn't lead to the best investment every week of those um, but um, there are other times where I think it does kind of, again, like Danae and Janelle were talking about, kind of falls into their larger inquiry. Um, you know, this winter for us, um, whenever the Olympics happen, uh, it's just this huge deal because everybody around here is somehow associated with some Olympian or some, you know, story because this is a, you know, the, the ski team trains here and, and the skaters and everybody. Um, so, um, this one girl uh, who is a ski racer, um, she was already doing research around it. Um, mm -hmm. the, the story about, um, I didn't know this, but um, Ready to Fly, there's this movie called Ready to Fly and it's around, it's about this um, ski jumper named Lindsay Van. Uh, and this ski jumper, up until the last Olympics, you kind of might not remember this story, but um, the women weren't allowed to do ski jumping. And so um, she was really surprised that a lot of people hadn't seen this movie Ready to Fly and didn't know about Lindsay Van. Um, with this amazing story of uh, she was shut out of the 2010 Olympics, and she even jumped farther than all the men. And so because women's ski jumping wasn't sanctioned yet, um, she wasn't allowed to jump, and so this really compelling story about um, this this woman who you know furthered her sport. But um, in a larger sense, we talked a lot about politics in the Olympics because when the Olympics came here, there was this traveling exhibit about things like Hitler's thirty-six Olympics, how that was a platform for propaganda, and in almost every Olympics there was. Um, there's some controversy that bubbles up. And so in this one, um, there was a lot of uh, talk about, about uh, gay rights. So, you know, my, I already had students who were already kind of somewhere around those topics. Um, mm. And so that occasioned, you know, a, a different look at their inquiry. So, um, mm -hmm. so it, it came up on Do Now, and it, you're saying, and then... Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and we, we actually helped do that Do Now, you know, my students and I. Um, but it was because they were really, you know, pretty revved up about the, the event. 
So that's exciting. That's that that's getting a bigger audience for the inquiry that they're doing already. And, and right, like you were the youth organization that Matt you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you know some interesting things happened with her thing because she said um, with this because uh, she also sometimes she'll tweet and sometimes she'll um, do work on the blog there. And she said for this one I don't know. Um, I think I want to put this together as a blog uh, entry. And then, um, you know, there were like 28 comments and, and pretty interesting things, and she talked back a lot. So, you know, I look at discourse a lot and, and what works and what doesn't, and I thought this was really intriguing that she was um, really passionate about it, and um, the, the discussions that took place I thought were pretty fascinating too. So a lot of learning went on there, and there were people who... Uh, there was one student, I think, of Danae and Janelle's who said, I'm going to have to go back and look at an earlier post because I think I've changed my mind about this. The question was whether the Olympics and politics mix. So um, there were some really interesting um, conversations happening there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, I, I think that what um, keeps them, keeps their personal inquiry alive is, again, mm -hmm. how you frame it and the activities that you give them um, to kind of reflect on the do now. So yeah, they have the, the do now, they have the comments, and they're thinking globally. So I'm just, I'm, in my head is the do now fashion. So when Mrs. Boyd is presenting do now fashion to them, they're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. We get to discuss, you know, what's hot and what's not. And then when she rolled it out, they're like, okay, so not what I thought it was. But, <laughs> but then they get this idea like, okay, so behind what we purchase is a story about, okay, where did it come from? Um, these things are happening in Bangladesh, for example. Um, and then Mrs. Boyd said, okay, I want you guys to do like a, a closet map, like take pictures of your clothes and where they came from so you guys know exactly, you know, where your money's going and things like that. And it just opened their eyes to say, oh, okay, so when I'm, when I'm thinking fashion, which they were thinking something very, you know, um, superficial, you know, trends, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. But then they, they instantly were like, oh, okay, so in my own closet I have these things that, yeah, maybe it's it's not a good thing and maybe, maybe you know, I bought something from the, you know, the factory that collapsed or maybe, and, and by bringing it in, you start with something wide, but then by giving them opportunities to reflect more on their own personal world, it becomes very... Um, specific to their own context and um, that's what keeps it from being a prescribed curriculum. Mm -hmm. every, every week I, when I'm creating the lessons I purposefully try to have them do something new and different that they haven't done either in a long time or you know that they've never done before within the do now whether it was using mm -hmm. um, tour builder creating their um, map of their closet or um, creating, you know, a Zika or something like that. We're just trying to introduce the digital media technology as well as, okay, let's look at this at this perspective and try it this way to keep it fresh for them because if it was, you know, just the post and just the replies every week, that may not be enough to sustain their interest. That may get old for them and sometimes. So. So that that list of, of options that's on the do now itself, or you have Oftentimes, that somewhere. Oftentimes, um, they will suggest um, when you look mm -hmm. at the introduction, you'll scroll down. There'll be a short little paragraph right before the prompt, and it will suggest maybe you know try a video this week, or you know click here for the Ziga, and you'll go to their digital media page, and then it might be um, like I'm going to start looking into using uh, popcorn. Uh, next, so you know, you just look for those little nuggets as they give them to you, or you know, you pull from your own toolbox. Um, when we were doing, um, I think it was the Olympics, if I can remember, um, and maybe Janelle, you can help me remember when we did the Vokey. I had I had done Vokeys years ago, and you know, it's not anything new, but a lot of our learners had never used a Vokey or created one before. So we're like, okay, create a Vokey and, you know, state your thesis within the Vokey and post that um, on the discussion board and, and tweet it. 
So, yeah, I think they end up with their own little toolbox. So now, since we've made so much media, I'll just ask them. I was like, I just need to know: Are you guys tired of Zegas? Are you tired of this? And they're like, No, I think that's the best fit. So all of a sudden, they're being able to critically say, Oh, I'm going to use this here. I'm going to use this here. I'm going to use this here. And they're really able to navigate and negotiate, you know, which tools they're going to use for which purpose. So you have that added benefit with the do now. I, th I think that's an amazing uh, skill to have is to sort of think about the, how the format or the platform of how you're making your argument informs the, the content and the argument that you're making. That's, that's real deep engagement in terms of authoring um, and sort of in the new media world. I think that's, that's amazing. So I'm impressed with the community I'm hearing um, around the do-nows. Um, I'm, Matt, I'm just wondering how much you and KQED Education thinks about working with teachers. So let me put it in a kind of harsh way. So when, when you see a teacher who's just sort of, uh, you know, plodding ahead with response, response, and you want them to kind of move out into this other, what you just described, mm -hmm. thinking about other media, how do you encourage that to happen? I mean, how does how do they see examples in the community? How does do you think about working with teachers? Well, we do work with teachers. Every semester, we have a working group of teachers, uh, about sixty or so, um, and they go through the process of uh, going through a do now orientation, and they get weekly um, uh, emails about the do now that come with different resources that can help in terms of media production. Um, Every two weeks, we post a video tutorial on how to use a new media production tool, like Popcorn or Ziga or an interactive timeline uh, platform like uh, Time Toast um, or Dippity, um, or uh, how to make a meme or how to make an animated GIF. Or you know, there's there's just all this amazing free production uh, sites that students can leverage as part of their production process, and um, so. It, so the working group sort of, in a very sort of asynchronous, informal way, gives teachers that experience to, um, to uh, or, that, or that community to kind of to try it out and, and begin to go into, into um, a deeper kind of engagement. Um, but the, that, I mean, that's been it thus far. What I would, I'm excited to announce is that this summer we're going to be uh, launching our, uh, it's called Hashtag Teach Do Now, which is going to be a Do Now MOOC, um, which is really going to look at like looking at the framework of Do Now, like through a series of six Do Nows. We're going to look at you know 21st century teaching and learning, looking at issues of online safety and uh, media making as writing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Common Core standards and sort of the, the types of t the toolkit that teachers uh, can use to kind of um, really best uh, implement the Do Now project. Um, and give them that that pedagogical strategy um, to successfully get students to really engage in a meaningful way. Um, there's, I mean, we have a like you said, Paul. We have an amazing community here presented with with uh, Chris and Janelle and Danae, who are incredible teachers and in how they get their students to engage with Do Now. But that's not an automatic thing that happens mm -hmm. for any teacher with any student. Um, I imagine that there are some teachers out there that are looking at the Do Now prompt and their students see the question. And that's it. And then they just reply mm -hmm. to that question from that entry point only. Um, I imagine there's a lot of use of do now that's not to the level of, of engagement that, that, we, that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we want to try to do, continue to develop more opportunities for teachers to, 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 to gain those skills of, um, you know, of, of, and their pedagogical strategies of implementing do now in a more meaningful way. So, Janelle, sorry, I, I, I want to get back. I have a bigger question for you, but Janelle said a couple of interesting <laughs> things here. The, the, the hashtag um, business here, the hashtag do now pie and hashtag do now fashion, and you say you're getting lots of responses. How does all that work? Well, okay, I think that's another thing. Um, a lot of people, when we're at the spring meeting, they ask us, well, how do you grade that, and how do you track those things? And so um, Danae and I we created our own like class hashtag, so it's hashtag Boyd Bents. And so you see that strand and they can kind of see, you know, what what kind of responses our other um, our other uh, learners have been 
posting because they do have the choice of doing on Twitter. They do a tweet every week, but then they also do um, they also do the discussion board, and that's another um, area where our learners are again saying like, well, no, the blog right now is going to suit my purpose because I need to have a little bit longer discussion, or I could do a link to that post. Um, but they're learning how to they're learning how to negotiate that social media. They're learning how to to figure out what fits their purpose. But then they also see the value in Twitter. I mean, they're sitting there and they're revising and they're revising and they're revising to get their opinion down also with some evidence so they can have their not only their opinion out there but with some evidence. Um, and, and that's really important and that's a skill that they've appreciated doing. I mean, it's really, like I said before, it really helps to um, them to write a thesis. But how did those middle school teachers contact you about the fashion project? You did? Oh, okay. Well, that okay. That was a note for me to remember the do now fashion. But um, mm -hmm. it was a note to Matt also that um, mm -hmm. a spring meeting we got all across to that, and uh, I'm still like when people are reading, um, like from all the webinars we've been doing and talking about do now, I'm getting a lot of requests saying, okay, well, what about middle school students? Because there are some topics that um, mm -hmm. you know may not. You know, middle schoolers may not be ready for some of the topics. Like we did the the do now abortion, which granted was really about you know state rights and federal rights. But um, you know, people get very caught up in the idea of abortion and trying to make it the abortion debate. So for a middle mm -hmm. schooler, that would be tough. Um, but they they're wanting to expand, and um, even um, professors with uh, pre service teachers, they want to be able to use this for other levels. So it's just a yeah. little. Reminder to Matt. <laughs> I got, I got. You. Matt, Matt. So, so my big question you're not going to be able to answer, but I want to explore um, also. Yes. Um, but you know, the time, future shows. <laughs> but, but like as you were describing the kind, the the, the groups that you already work with mm -hmm. and so forth, I was about to say, well, aren't you a MOOC already? And then you said you're going to be a MOOC. So, uh, what's the difference between what you do already and a MOOC? Well, <laughs> you don't have to answer that, but. Well, well, the do now um, working groups. It's it's sort yeah. of it's happening in action. It's they're they're a, they're they it's helping inform us on do now and helping to make it uh, more engaging. And mm -hmm. but they're they're using the prompts weekly with their students. The MOOC is more of a professional learning opportunity for teachers to learn about do now, but also learn about you know ideas of like using social media as a professional learning network or. Thinking about um, digital citizenship or uh, uh, different types of argumentation writing uh, with media, um, it's sort of giving you the, the sort of the, the back end skills to really successfully implement do now. Um, so by it's doing really, them yourself, yeah. Sorry? Is it, by doing them yourself, is that true well, in, the, in the MOOC? Or it's it, well, we're we're still it's still very it's it, we we just started thinking about it so we don't really exactly yeah, know but we want to kind of engage the conversation where it's not like a lecture base it's more like the actual structure of the MOOC are do now prompts that are sort of pedagogical issues. Mm -hmm. well, you've got, you've given us a lot to think about. I yeah. I, I, I want to just say one more thing about, about professional learning okay. yes. and that yeah. is. Uh, we also uh, published a, a Twitter guide for, for teaching, um, and a lot of the articles and resources are things that, that uh, you know, Janelle and Chris have um, used and, and put with, you know, for their students to develop these awesome grading criteria and rubrics, um, and there's a lot of different articles about, you know, just, uh, and resources for, for thinking about Twitter for teaching, which kind of helps also at this sort of, um, this issue of 21st century pedagogy. And that guide might be a good thing to take to somebody to say, look, we have this guide, let's open it up to, right? <laughs> yeah, and there's actually resources for administrators to say that, that talk about the value mm -hmm. of social media for learning and articles from uh, MindShift that talk about, you know, that dispel the myths of the DOE and, and in terms of access and E-Trade and, you know, all these sort of, uh, you know, restricted um, uh, uh, ways of, of limiting access on Internet. Mm -hmm. district initiatives. So, well, yeah. I, I'm going to call time on this tonight. I, really, because <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I, I do want to say that um, next week, maybe, probably, we're thinking of, of getting together to start asking a question that I just asked, but about 
um, at least middle school to high school, maybe K twelve. Like, what would a what would a middle school, high school K twelve MOOC look like? Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, maybe you know, maybe do now as part of what that MOOC would be in a MOOC, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so yeah. So I, it, it'd be worth thinking about. Um, so but that's I think, it, I think it's true. in terms of a MOOC for learners, do now mm -hmm. sort of fulfills that. In, but, say in what way? Well, that there's just a massive audience of, of learners participating in in um, you know uh, project based learning essentially um, that deals with civic issues or arts or science um, and it deals with um, you know uh, you know writing um, media writing media and articulating skills uh, with new media technologies. Um, so yeah, so it is a MOOC for learners, but the yeah, just to go back again to the to the teach do now, that would be a MOOC mm -hmm. for more geared towards educators. Yeah, I, I, I get that too. So and and then when I when I hear you talking about radio rookies and, and youth um, youth radio and and then I, I throw in there in my own head um, the learning network, uh, New York Times Learning Network. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just kind of there's this amazing kind of um, I don't know what to call it. Beautiful forest of of <laughs> tools available to to high school kids at this point. Mm -hmm. It's great, and the you know we're all taking advantage of that in wonderful ways. Um, thank you for describing that very very quickly because we want to get off here. Um, do you have a last thought, Chris? And then we'll hear it from everyone. Oh uh, well, yeah. I guess what I like about it is that <clears throat> we've mentioned it. There's these existing networks that have connected. So there's the National Writing Project and the teachers and all their students, which, you know, is pretty mm -hmm. substantial and extensive. And then KQED, which already had this network. And I think some powerful things have happened at those points of intersection, and it's pretty interesting and, and good work. Cool. Danae? Um, I, I just love Do Now. I mean, we started using it in our classroom a little bit last year, spotty here and there, and this year we've just gone... Hmm hardcore and the content within our classroom and their learning is so much richer um, and, and engaging as well so I'm really pleased and I can't wait um, for next year we're adding a AP human geography section and where we're gonna take do now with that section is uh, exciting so we've got some training we're gonna look at over the summer and I can't wait for that that's interesting because uh, thinking about it school-wide is an interesting thing to yeah opens up a lot of possibilities. And Janelle, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just saying, and we have um, a lot of the educators in our building ask us about it, and they want to know more about it, and they, they're they also seeing the um, excitement of the learners and always talking about do now, you know, and it might be do now this or do now that, but, yeah, they want to know more about it as well. Janelle. Um, I think that, um, yeah, we have all of these um, great networks, um, and they're working almost synergistically. Like, I'm also using um, the New York Times Learning Network 2 stuff um, this week, so that's mm -hmm. kind of funny that you say that. Um, but I think also that as these networks open up and as these activities and learning opportunities open up for us, it's up to the educators to really advocate for those and use them in a rigorous, meaningful way, but also in an academic sense to make sure that that work continues, to make sure that networks can continue to reach out to one another, and so we can continue to offer these rich opportunities, these authentic opportunities for our kids. But it's up to us to really, you know, kind of contribute also to the networks and really advocate for those. So that's why webinars like these are so exciting. Um, just the idea of being able to share the work that our kids are doing, I mean, it speaks for themselves, but without networks like KQED, National Writing Project, Innovator, ed, innovative ed, educator, um, we wouldn't be able to share our students' work, and that's really what it's about. Cool. Matt, do you want to say anything else? Yeah, I mean, I would just like to say that I, I love the work of, you know, Chris and Janelle and Danae and other National Writing Project teachers who have participated with Do Now, and that they have really uh, led the way of showing how this activity can can provide that kind of rigor and, and, and um, learning outcomes. Um, and really just help reinforce that what we're doing is of value and 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 well, we can continue to grow and, and, and push the envelope. Um, and it's just really exciting that 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 you guys are doing um, are involved in the way that you're involved. And it's just it just 
lays a foundation for others to um, to do similar types of engagement and work. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you all for making very clear how important this work is. So it's nice. <laughs> It's really cool. So I um, do want to invite you back anytime. Uh, here, we're here every Wednesday evening um, at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. And you guys in between, you can figure it out, right? So, <laughs> um, and uh, we are um, part of the EdTech Talk um, channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, and uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set that up several years ago, many years ago at this point. Um, thank you all for tonight, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.